Uh, people tend to think that the stem cells are this brand new phenomenon that landed on planet Earth uh, in the last few years, when in reality, they've been around for a very long time. So let's just take a minute for an historic perspective. Now, as far back as the 1880s, scientists recognized that cells are the building block of the body and that there was a particular type of cell that could duplicate itself. Now, in the early 1900s, they discovered this duplicating cell in blood. And by the uh, 1950s and early 1960s, they found this duplicating cell in bone marrow. Now, in the early 60s, um, possibly as late as 1968, the first successful bone marrow transplant took place uh, involving two siblings who had a condition called combined severe immunodeficiency. Now, by 1978, they discovered these duplicating cells in umbilical cord blood, but it wasn't until actually 1988 that they were able to find these cells in adipose tissue. Now, these duplicating cells and cellular component that they're talking about, uh, we now know as stem cells. Well, uh, with the finding of stem cells in adipose tissue in the 80s, it was just a matter of a few years when stem cells were identified in every tissue of the body. Uh, well, this created an explosion of research and a lot of excitement and new therapies associated with this. Uh, over the course of the next several years, they began to realize that these cells from our own body did have some limiting factors. And these um, limiting factors, the quality and quantity of those cells are based specifically on our age and our health. And it's even worse if we happen to have an autoimmune disease. So uh, new technologies emerged. We have found amniotic fluid and amniotic tissue, which had very good effects in the joints. Now, as we reviewed, really the uh, milieu of what's in this product, we find there are some growth factors and there are some proteins, but there are no live cells. Uh, just due to the processing of this product, they don't have the ability to have live cells, yet they work fairly well. Now, if we go to the newest and latest technology, it's cells derived from the umbilical cord blood of live, healthy birth babies. Now, these do have live viable cells, specifically based on how these cells are processed. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's do a little uh, time for review of exactly what we're dealing with on STELS and stem cell therapy. So uh, you have three different types of therapies, of, of grafts you can have. You can have an autograft or uh, tologous, which is taken from your body and putting it back into your body. You have an oligraft or an oligeneic graft, which you take from somebody else's body and put into your body. Or you can have a xenograft, and a xenograft is taken from a different species and put into your body. Uh, an example would be uh, in the early days of heart valve surgery. They used heart valves from pigs and put them into human bodies and people were uh, to survive. So. Now that we know that, that about stem cells, there are a couple of main categories of stem cells that they have to have two minimum qualities. Now, there's a very complex specification by the uh, International Society for Stem Cells that's a very complex definition. But the two basic definitions are, number one, in order to be a stem cell, it must have renewability. In other words, uh, it can undergo mitosis. Now, a stem cell from umbilical cord has this capability to undergo mitosis and duplicate itself every 28 hours for they've seen up to um, 90 generations. Now, this is in vitro. Secondary uh, minimum quality is it must have potency. Uh, potency, uh, when you're talking about stem cells, is defined as the ability to differentiate into any other type of cell. So how do they work? People tend to think that when stem cells go into your body, um, heart music plays and the, the hand of God comes down and touches you and, and somehow magically this whole stem cell thing works. And that's not the way it is. Uh, when the cells go into your body, they are attracted to damaged cells because damaged cells give off a chemical signal in the space around that cell, uh, which is called the paracrine space. Stem cells are attracted to that and they're home to that. They will attach themselves to a nearby blood vessel and then become a parasite. Uh, as a parasite, it will give nutritional support to the cells, actually rendering them back to their normal functioning condition. 
So uh, what are the main uh, capacities of, of what these cells can do and, and their main capabilities? Uh, one of the strongest capabilities of stem cell is its anti-inflammatory effect. When uh, somebody's injured, we see this whole biochemical array happen at the injured site, whether it's in a joint or it's in soft tissue. There's a production of tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma and the whole array of interleukins, interleukin 1, 2, and 12. And this whole pro-inflammatory set uh, comes into play. These are our T1 helper cells. They're necessary when we have an injury that uh, for that inflammatory process to take place. Now, what mesenchymal stem cells do in response to that is they give a whole array of anti-inflammatory proteins, uh, uh, immunomodulatory cytokines, such as uh, prostate gland and E2, which relaxes smooth muscle tissue growth factor beta-2, uh, hepatocyte growth factor, nitric oxide, interleukin-4, 6, and 10. And it goes, it goes on and on and on. But the most important one that we see in there, or one of, of the most important ones, is interleukin-1RA. And, and we'll talk about that later, but uh, those are the T2 helper cells that help to balance this inflammatory process. Uh, another uh, large function of stem cells is their immunomodulatory effect. The key immunomodulatory cytokines involved are some of the ones uh, you saw before, PGE2, uh, TGF, uh, beta-1, HDF, SDF1, uh, nitrous oxide, the list goes on and on and on, to include interleukin-4, 6, and 10, and again, the interleukin-1RA. So this is important because most autoimmune disorders are what they call T1-weighted, or they're pro-inflammatory. So umbilical cord stem cells have the capability of very rapidly modulating and balancing these T1 and T2 helper cells. So uh, it is no longer specifically attacking our body. Now, another major function of a stem cell is what's called uh, anti-apoptic effect. Uh, apoptosis is programmed cell death. It's, it literally means cell suicide. As cells get old and don't function correctly, uh, at some point in time, they burst their cell walls, uh, spit out the DNA, and, and they go away. Uh, stem cells have the capability uh, that when they come near a cell that's old, uh, that's called a, a senescent cell that's aged and no longer functioning correctly, the stem cell can actually give it that uh, trophic support that we talked about and bring it back to a healthy functioning state. Now, when you have a cell that's functioning in that healthy functioning state, it's now helps the cells around it to function correctly. Another uh, property of stem cells, and, and this is really new and exciting research, uh, is its antimicrobial effect. Stem cells have a native immune offense against microbial infections. And, and this immune offense comes from really a host of polypeptides. They think uh, in the latest research that this polypeptide L37 is the big boy that's really being very effective. They're doing studies right now against acute infections and chronic infections and even significant systemic infections. And they've had very good response with it. Also, what's interesting to note is they found out that it is also uh, effective against protozoa. Uh, protozoa is important because uh, this is what we see in Lyme disease, and it can definitely give us some help in that area. Now, the next thought really has to be safety. Is this safe for me? Well, I can stand up here all day and tell you about the safety of it, but the researchers around the world can tell you what the safety is. And quoting uh, Dr. Arnold Kaplan, who is uh, really the godfather of stem cell in the United States, uh, he says mesenchymal stem cells produce huge quantity of biomolecules, some of which are uh, immunosuppressive. Now these stem cells put up a curtain of molecules around themselves that allow these donor cells to be transplanted into recipient free from an immune response. Uh, he calls these cells immune privilege. So uh, while the body will naturally release these pro-inflammatory markers, we, we hear them all the time, tumor necrosis, uh, factor alpha, interferon gamma, and a whole list of interleukins, which are part of the pro-inflammatory phase in order to create an immune response. 
Uh, what the stem cells do is release interleukin-4, interleukin-10, and all these T2 helper cells, and these immunomodulatories that actually mask the stem cells. So they're not recognized and you don't have an immune response. So there are multiple advantages to using the cells and the stem cells from umbilical cord blood over other products. So number one, these cells contain growth factors, proteins, and live nucleated cells. That includes stem cells versus, say, uh, another product like amniotic fluid or amniotic tissue that really contains some growth factors. Uh, and they can turn some proteins, but very few, if any, live cells. And really, due to the manufacturing process of amniotic fluid and tissue, it's really not possible to have live cells because of the snap freezing process that kills them all. So people tend to think that the stem cell is the big thing that we're talking about here. Stem cell is only one singular component. There is a very large cellular component, uh, this whole milieu of living nucleated cells that we see. And we wanna take a minute to kind of go over those because there's some really important ones. One of the big ones is called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, it's a protein uh, that's produced by cells in this product that stimulates angiogenesis. Now, an angiogenesis is the creation of blood vessels. So this is really important in areas uh, that say have low vascularity, such as inside a joint or around uh, uh, chondrocytes cartilage, inside a joint or uh, say in somebody who's had a physical injury where they've, they've had hypoxic event and there's not a lot of oxygen in the area. VEGF is very important for that. Another, another big one is fibroblast growth factor two. It's a mitogen. Now, what a mitogen means is that it encourages mitosis or the proliferation of cells. Uh, we also have immune cells, which are regulatory T cells that help them modulate the immune system. And this one, you've heard me talk about it uh, a few times so far, and it's interleukin 1RA. And uh, what that basically means is interleukin 1 receptor antagonist. Now, you remember a pro inflammatory cell is interleukin 1. Uh, Interleukin 1A is an antagonist and will not allow the expression of the interleukin 1 or that inflammatory process. So uh, this is a natural inhibitor of the inflammatory state. Uh, it's very key in immunomodulation and it inhibits uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is indicated in many autoimmune diseases. It's well known that an increase in tumor necrosis factor alpha in your body has a direct correlation to uh, disability, death, and cognitive decline. So uh, we want to have as much interleukin 1RA as possible to keep the tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, in our body significantly diminished. So function of a stem cell for a long time in the early days, we really believe that the uh, mesenchymal stem cells would just jump in there and replace all this tissue. Uh, what they've learned over time is it's really the cellular components around these stem cells that are creating much of the product. Uh, so again, I speak of Dr. Arnold Kaplan uh, and at the meeting with the FDA back in September. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, who's widely regarded, as I've said before, the godfather of mesenchymal stem cells in the United States, urged in his presentation to the FDA that the FDA and the scientific community at large stop referring to MSCs as uh, mesenchymal stem cells and instead identify them as medicinal signaling cells. Now this language change is meant to recognize the ability uh, MSCs uh, to have strong medicinal effects while identifying that they do not exert all uh, their efforts by regenerating tissue, but rather by leveraging the sensory capabilities and positively affecting the microenvironment and being the sentinels uh, for the injury. Now, other advantages uh, to these stem cells other than their massive medicinal signaling effect, uh, they have an, an abundant supply of MSCs. Uh, there's no need to collect them though uh, through an invasive uh, procedure like liposuction or bone marrow uh, aspirate. And umbilical cord cells have the ability to proliferate and differentiate much more effective than other types of cells and therefore are considered to be more potent. So uh, if you were to do a search of, of clinicaltrials.gov, you would see that now there are over 5,300 clinical trials being conducted worldwide. 
Now, less than six months ago, that number was just above 4,000. So it, it's an explosion of research uh, that's taking place. So uh, a, a lot of people will ask, well, tell me about uh, the FDA guidelines and how does, how does that go? So uh, basically, umbilical cord stem cells are regulated by the uh, American Association of Tissue Banks. They're all uh, rigorously tested for disease according to tissue bank regulations, uh, no different than any blood uh, that's donated or organs or skin or anything like that. And they don't allow uh, expanding of the product. So uh, there's some FDA regulations involved uh, with this that uh, we need to be cognizant of. And it's called uh, CFR Part uh, 1271, Section 361, that says there are four basic criteria that we have to follow according to the FDA. Uh, number one, uh, that they have to be intended for homologous use determined by labeling and advertising. In other words, only what uh, that cell can naturally do. Uh, they have to be minimally manipulated and manufactured and you cannot expand those cells. So number three, it's, it's manufactured does not involve the combination uh, with any other article except for uh, like water crystalloids or some sterilizing and preserving agents because they don't want to alter these live cells. Uh, and number four, that has not had uh, a systemic effect that is not dependent upon the metabolic activity of living cells for its primary function. So these are some very basic, easy guidelines to follow, and it's things that uh, we're very cognizant of on a corporate level of what we need to do.